Hello and welcome to another episode of Rebel Heroines, the podcast celebrating the rebel heroines of the Greek myths through original audio drama, poetry, book and theatre reviews and interviews with fellow fans. In this podcast, the somewhat toxic heroes of the ancient world take a step back as we delve into the stories of the women who shaped their destinies and champion the female authors bringing these nuanced women to life. Who are these women to us today? What do they represent if we remove the patriarchal narratives that defined them and continue to do so? That's what we're getting at here. Don't get me wrong, I like the blokes too. I definitely would have fancied Ganymede and Adonis and Narcissus by the aesthetics of the time, for sure. Though I can't imagine any of them being great conversational companions. I mean, they're basically just pretty boys. What are they going to talk about? Oh, all these older guys and hot chicks and goddesses and gods keep throwing themselves at me. What a bore. I would have been like, oh yeah, yeah, poor you for being so stupidly good looking. Let's get down to business. <laughs> um, that would be my I'm a feminist but statement on the guilty feminist. And if you've never heard of that podcast, shame on you. Get listening. It was a big inspiration for this one. A cheeky little music recommendation before we get started a band called The People Versus, who I discovered at a festival last year, and they are just sublime. And they've got a lot of their songs inspired by Greek myth. And two great songs are inspired by characters in the Odyssey, Calypso and Charybdis, which is why I'm plugging them on today's episode. And there's also a Persephone one too. They are a rather fabulous band. I've seen them live twice now. I'd love to get them on the show one day. Imagine that. I'm sure I could fit most of the band in my bedroom, no problem. Another relevant music plug, Wendy Rule, The Lotus Eaters, a whole album of evocative haunting siren songs inspired by the Odyssey. It's quite um, writhe under the moon with a snake in your hair, dramatic. Check her out. A throwback to episode two, I finished reading The Shadow of Perseus by Claire Hayward and I recommend it if you'd like to delve into the lives of Danae, Medusa and Andromeda, not just in terms of their impact on Perseus, but more importantly, his on theirs. This book throws up an interesting debate in terms of this genre the question of whether to involve the gods or not, to God or not to God. I've read great books that do, great books that don't. This is one of the great ones that don't. And by not having the gods in there as characters, not um, having them intervening or showing favour in any way, Perseus is acting only off his own impulses. There's no excuses and Oh, it makes for a very different Perseus to the hero who is validated by the gods. Give Shadow of Perseus a read. Natalie Haynes. Yes, I probably will mention her in every episode, along with Dionysus. It's just the way I roll. Natalie Haynes has made a new book announcement. Exciting. It's called Divine Might and it's about the goddesses of Greek mythology and it's out in September. Whoop! And this is a nice segue into another great feminist author from the Midlands as I'm going to start this month's episode with a quote from her and she is Caitlin Moran and this is a quote from her book More Than a Woman. Middle-aged women, informally and without any official support, provide the resource and care that one would more usually expect to come from an economically successful first world state. We do not hear stories about middle-aged women and their lives, their triumphs and woes. When we do, it's either seen as boring or else ignored entirely. I think Penelope, the focus of this episode, in her later years would have appreciated this quote. Penelope, wife of Odysseus, the cunning hero of the Iliad and the Odyssey. 
So let's unpack why I chose to open with this quote by first putting Penelope in context. She's the daughter of a mortal king and, in some accounts, a water nymph mother. She is chosen by Odysseus at the contest of suitors for Helen. He sees something in her worth more than Helen's fatal beauty and he comes up with the grand plan of all the other Greek suitors agreeing that they will respect Helen's choice of husband and go to war on his behalf should any of the other suitors abduct her. But of course he didn't bank on Paris coming along. At the time this was an ingenious plan to avoid bloodshed and this will become particularly ironic not just because of the Trojan War, but because of what happens when Odysseus finally gets home. So he basically cheats in a foot race to win Penelope's hand in marriage. He takes her back to Ithaca, which doesn't have much going for it unless you're into goats and rocks. And they have a son, Telemachus. And for all intents and purposes, a good marriage of equals. Then the Trojan War comes along and 10 years of waiting for it to be over is gruelling enough as it is for this single mum who was barely out of girlhood before she had to take on the reins of a kingdom. But then Odysseus pisses off Poseidon because he can't help but be a big, smooth-talking, bragging show-off. And it takes him another 10 years of maritime disasters, monsters and goddess humping and having a few illegitimate children with them to get back home to his beloved wife. And in the meantime, what is Penelope doing? Well, she brings up her child alone with love, even though he talks to her like she's a piece of shit when he hits adolescence. She keeps her household and her husband's kingdom safe and prosperous despite the very real threat to her property, her son's life and her safety due to the presence of a group of men who are just waiting for the opportunity to claim her wealth and who give her false praise for their own ends. And she does it all without giving in to the pressure to remarry, running away, stabbing anyone up or being a total hard-nosed, uncompromising bitch, though to be fair, she has every reason to be. Once Odysseus is gone, she's only got her cleverness, her patience, her resourcefulness to get herself and everyone else left on Ithaca through the dark, uncertain years. She's seen as the perfect wife through the male gaze of the time because she behaves. She doesn't run off with a hot young Trojan prince like her cousin Helen or stab her husband up for being a child murderer like her other cousin Clytemnestra. However, and this is something Natalie Haynes explores wonderfully in Pandora's Jar. Read it if you haven't read it yet, it's awesome. And I agree with her that the Penelope that is praised in the Odyssey and the Iliad is rarely seen for what she actually is. She's compared to these other problematic women because of what she is not. She's held up as an example of the ideal good wife among all these treacherous, changeable women who think they have the right to justice or sexual autonomy. Her inner landscape is defined by her relationship to Odysseus, how her virtue, her patience, her chastity is a credit to him, how she's expected to remain untempted by the men literally clawing at her door, although it's okay for Odysseus to shag around with goddesses. There is a lot to unpack concerning her marriage. The most striking thing for me is that they choose each other. Odysseus chooses her over competing for Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world. She chooses him when her father, oddly, begs her not to leave with her new husband and Odysseus asks her to choose and she chooses her husband. Well, you know, you would. Her father then literally made a monument to her modesty, but I think Penelope should get a monument to her resourceful nerve and her determination. Before the fallout of his absence, her and Odysseus make a good match. They both love stories, they're both cunning, quick-witted, and it saves them many times. They're one of the few well-matched, equally balanced power couples in Greek myth. 
Even when he comes back and he's in disguise and she blatantly knows it's him, she still tests him. They're still testing each other. They're still, after all this time, feeling each other out because the fact is they spend the majority of their marriage apart. She is deemed the ultimate patient wife by authors of the time because she remains loyal. In patriarchal terms, the perfect wife is one who stays at home while the men are off adventuring and shagging and she doesn't rock the boat and she keeps his goods in check, including herself. Does this mean she is just a pliant, submissive, boring, non-person? Not in my opinion. From a feminist standpoint for me, Penelope is the perfect rebel heroine because she doesn't need her husband's presence to gain and keep authority and autonomy, keep the rules from the door and bring up her son and protect her kingdom on her own terms. I can't imagine like Helen of Troy having the resources to do the same. This is proved by the fact that when Odysseus comes back, that's when things really go tits up because he feels compelled to reinstate his power through a bloodbath. He does choose Penelope over hot goddess Calypso's offer of immortality, but does that excuse his actions when he gets home? We'll come back to these actions later. Penelope has to be a hands-on, practical queen. She doesn't have men to protect her as such or to order around because they're all old men or young boys or farmhands or suitors who aren't going to budge until she picks one of them. Her ingenious idea to keep the suitors at bay, that she will weave a shroud for her father-in-law and only when it's finished will she choose one of them for her husband and unbeknownst to them, undoes most of her work at night, is a masterstroke of cunning. Weaving goes from being the hard work that keeps women in the house and out of trouble into a political act of survival and loyalty to the husband who could be dead for all she knows. Penelope's deception is hard work. It's even harder to unravel the weaving than to make it, yet she is patient and willing to use what's in front of her, which is literally imprisoning her, to free herself. Penelope weaves a physical yarn for the survival of herself, her family, her people, her kingdom, while Odysseus is busy spinning verbal yarns to save his own skin. To me, she is the ultimate rebel heroine because her rebellion is quiet, it's cunning, it takes years to yield any result and it serves others who she sees as her responsibility. It's not using your beauty to save your life, it's not waging a war you're destined to lose, it's not turning against anyone or shaking things up, though there are still, unfortunately, casualties. It's a rebellion played out in the domestic space of the middle-aged woman with the world on her shoulders, with mouths to feed, with vulnerable people to protect and no one to protect her except the other women she takes her cues from as she grows up with them, grows from girl to mother. The reason I started with that Caitlin Maranco is because the underlying theme of her book is that despite what governments full of white, cisgendered, middle-class, middle-aged men would have you believe, it's tired, middle-aged women who run the world in the background with the odds always stacked against them and with little thanks or acknowledgement for their pains. This is the kind of woman Penelope is in a modern context for me. The single mum always worrying about money. The vulnerable woman who must placate and navigate violent men she can't escape from to keep her children and herself safe. She's a woman from Greek myth that I think a lot of women can relate to. We know a Penelope. Maybe we are a Penelope. She doesn't get to go on any big adventures. She doesn't have any real clout. She doesn't get the respect she deserves or the true justice she's owed for what she sacrificed. She doesn't get seen for the nuanced woman she is. And though Odysseus praises her for her cleverness, even he underestimates her. And yet she endures, she thrives, she gives. There's a lot to love and relate to. 
While Odysseus is away, Penelope's parents pressure her to remarry and you have to wonder, would Penelope's life have been any easier if she'd chosen one of the suitors or would she have had her own Helen of Troy style battle of the suitors on her hands? In other versions of Penelope's myth, she is seduced by a suitor and in another has it off with Hermes, a god no less, and even has his love child, Pan, oddly enough. It's no surprise, though, that the most enduring myth is the one where she stays chaste and patient and suffers beautifully, sighing for her wondrous husband. This is the crux of the matter, really. As much as Odysseus makes out before he goes off to war that he wants to stay, it's clear he also craves adventure and status. So this brings us to some book reviews. Penelope makes a brief appearance in Clytemnestra by Costanza Cassati and I will be reviewing that book more fully when Clytemnestra gets her own episode but Penelope's presence and her character in this book are really refreshing because she does unconventional things like ride to Sparta unescorted and verbally spars with her future husband over the feast table. And Clytemnestra sees the potential for a just and level-headed queen in her, even though she's so young at this point. In Claire North's Ithaca, Penelope is the focus, but seen through a rather left-field narrator in the form of Hera, Queen of the Heavens, which, because of the reason Hera is there at all, and I won't spoil it, totally works, actually. As I mentioned at the start, to God or not to God can really determine how well a myth retelling can work. And in this instance, seeing this adventure through Hera's eyes is a stroke of genius because even Hera, famous for punishing women for the crime of being raped by her own husband, finds a begrudging respect for this woman. This woman who realises she has to take a stand both against the suitors and against the pirates attacking Ithaca and how she mobilises the women and the community they create to keep the rest of the inhabitants, you know, the old men, the scrappy boys and most prominently the women of all ages that have been left behind. Like how they keep them safe and feel valued is really enjoyable to discover as it unfolds. She can't survive without them and their collective wisdom and strong bonds of loyalty grow and are tested very much away from the dominance of men. In fact, to unify against the men who are waiting like wolves to take everything from them. Her relationships with others and her inner world are very nuanced and she's very likeable and we empathise with her everyday struggles. Is there enough food? Why is my son being such a stroppy little bitch? Is my husband ever coming back to take the pressure off? All that passive aggressive tapping away at her sanity but without it feeling like she's a victim or a martyr. Great book, recommend it. My favourite book about Penelope is what I think most feminist Greek retelling authors would agree is a seminal text for this genre, The Penelope Ad by Margaret Atwood. Before we even get into the content, the title itself is a nice touch because it takes the syntax we associate with the classics about the heroes and makes the statement that Penelope is the hero of this story. She's a much more self-centred, acerbic, sarcastic version of Penelope. But again, why not? Why can't she be all these things? Why does she have to be perfect? And in another intriguing twist, we get the events of the Odyssey in retrospect because Penelope is speaking to us from the underworld in our time. She's very much relishing this freedom to be whoever she wants to be, tell her tale, throw her old adversaries under the bus. The sparring match with Helen is particularly entertaining. It's a fantastic piece of magical realism and has Margaret Atwood's trademark style. What's very different and unexpected about it is the focus she puts on characters that in the original are completely cast aside. Penelope's afterlife is plagued with guilt about what happened to her maids and they both figuratively and literally haunt her. In the original Odyssey, 
the maids are ordered to mop up the blood after the suitors are butchered by Odysseus and Telemachus, and then he hangs them because he believes they were disloyal and their death is pretty much all we ever really know about them. It shows up as well just how changed or rather more authentic Odysseus is being to his true nature. He treats and respects women better than most, yet still he sees the maids as worthless, as a stain on his reputation, as if the suitors' crimes were their crimes, as if what they were doing to keep the suitors entertained wasn't directly keeping them from his wife's door. Odysseus' absence has definitely made him paranoid and bloodthirsty. In the Penelope ad, which is, by the way, a play text as well as a novel, the maids are integral characters and unpacking their grisly fate was one of the big inspirations for Atwood telling this story because, to quote her, the hanging of the maids bothered me as it is so excessive in relation to anything they actually did. She gives them all names and different personalities and a shared purpose to help each other and Penelope survive the suitors. They agree with Penelope's plan to watch the suitors, cosy up with them to gain information and advantage and some of them even grow to love some of them and they help Penelope in her subterfuge about the shroud. When we first meet them, we hear in their own words how they are seen as nothing more than objects of servitude, but that they get their comforts and subtle paybacks when they can. But when Penelope sees where her own fate could lead her, she utilises her resources and the maids form an invisible web of protection around her and themselves. And it works. Until Odysseus comes back and his faithful old nurse Euryclea, who adores him, drugs Penelope so she sleeps through the massacre of the suitors and her 12 loyal maids who were killed because they did what Penelope asked. The maids are still seeking justice in the afterlife and Penelope tells us that were it not for fear of them, Odysseus would come to her though she has no illusions about him now. The book finishes with something completely unexpected yet timely in the form of a trial where the maids call Odysseus to account. It's worth mentioning that in the original Odyssey, Athena makes it so all the suitors' relatives conveniently forget that their king has massacred their children, which is just as well. Otherwise, Odysseus would have had a civil war on his hands. In contrast, who is left to care and remember the maids? Penelope. And what can she really do? She has to beat her grief down until she's literally dead and there are no consequences left. The Penelope ad is a great book. We see a less virtuous, more realistic version of Penelope. And we see her having to grapple with her own pride when the guilt sets in that she essentially sent out her maids as lamb to the slaughter to keep her own virtue safe. But then, what were the other appealing options where more bloodshed could have been avoided considering we are dealing with a bunch of not too bright, volatile men in competition with each other? In all these novel adaptations, we get to see her world, which shows you where the real power lies. It lies in domesticity, in shared secret female knowledge, in their status as being seen as harmless and underestimated. I think this is something women have always had to do and still do. I saw a great production of the Penelope ad at Birmingham University where they set Hades in a shipyard with the maids still having to drudge and clean and feel the weight of the oppressor on their backs. And it had songs, comedy moments, but was primarily focused on the complex relationship between Penelope, her elusive husband and her maids. And I recommend the play text as well as the novel, particularly if you're a theatre bod. And if you are, you know, put it on. It's got so much to play with. Incidentally, 
I've also seen a, a three-hander all-female show for schools where Odysseus was played by a wooden spoon, which was quite satisfying. But my favourite Odyssey-related show was a one-woman show called Penelope Retold by the fabulous Caroline Horton, where her modern-day Penelope was an army wife mobilising other army wives to stay hopeful and productive via the internet. And the whole show was set on a big bed. And at one point, Penelope decides to admit defeat and go on a date. And Caroline picked a man from the audience to come on stage. And a awkward yet very sweet ad lib ensued. And it was just a great example of how inventive people can get with the source material. I think the Odyssey has so much to explore as a theatre piece, as a film, TV show, all of that. Because, you know, it has got everything. But I have to say, I would be much more excited to see the Penelope ad given the same treatment, the same scope, as I feel like with the original. It's nothing we haven't really seen before over and over. And always the women are either the meek bystanders or the sexy goddesses or the cannon fodder. On that note, I'd like to end with a monologue from my own adaptation of the Penelope ad. And you might wonder, why do an adaptation of an adaptation? Well, Margaret Atwood herself calls her Penelope ad an echo of an echo of an echo. And why not keep expanding this new epic into different arenas as we've done with the old epic? I've been faithful to the original in my own words, but I wanted to take it further in terms of stretching this theme of the underworld and how the novel jumps between the past reality and the timeless magical realism. And I've gone all out with this idea of a cabaret with all the freedom that affords you to really play with cross-genre performance. In the Hollywood version, like picture this, I'd have a live band, I'd have aerial circus, I'd set it in a big, rundown, glossy, decadent Las Vegas hotel or something. I've got, at one point, Helen of Troy doing a burlesque act. (laughs) I know, it would be brilliant, right? If you've got a load of money and a beaten down hotel, let me know, we could make this work. But Yeah, the beating heart of it for me is the same in that it's Penelope and the maids who are the focus and how they relate to us in the modern world. If I ever do get to stage it and I have my finger in a pretty exciting pie, I'll keep you posted should anything come of that. I will definitely be previewing bits of it on the podcast. For now, I'm going to whet your appetite with the opening monologue from the character Crone Penelope, because in my version of this, there are three Penelopes, the maid, the mother and the crone, because I think Penelope is a fantastic character to explore the cycle of a woman's life when you put the focus on her as the heroine. And I do think she has to be many different women, depending on who she's in front of. I asked my friend, the fabulous Wanda Raven, to read it. And I asked her not to phase out her natural Birmingham black country accent because one, it's a nice link back to Caitlin Moran, a proud Wolverhamptonite. And also, as I said before, Penelope is everywhere. We all know one. Maybe we are one. And, you know, this Penelope doesn't have to be rich, royal, upper class. You know, she could be the woman you bump into at the food bank. So with that in mind, let's have Wanda play us out with Crone Penelope. Maybe I wanted adventure. My own adventures, not the ones that you span your yarns about. Maybe I could have been a warrior. Yes, me, meek Penelope. Maybe I could have slayed the Cyclops, laid waste to Troy through my cunning. I had cunning all along. You knew that before I did, I think. Maybe that's what drew you in. Or maybe that's why you stayed away so long. I had my own war, the war of endless responsibility. Your family, your servants, your land. The men, snarling like wolves, praising me the way the bards praised whatever goddess you were rumoured to be ploughing. When all they wanted was your wealth that I kept safe for you. 
that I doubled with my quick mind. Even when you thanked me, I knew you were also a little put out. The war of motherhood. My son growing up to hate me because he grew up without you. Though, no doubt you would have ruined him some other way if he displayed too much kindness and not enough love of a good scam. The war of jealousy, humiliation, sniggers behind my back, underestimated at every turn. Yes, I had my own war. Not nearly as noble and daring as yours, but I earned my scars through my resilience, my compassion. I was your widow, your housekeeper, far longer than I was your wife, King of Ithaca. I was the one left behind to feed your island of widows and unwed daughters, to trade with scavengers, keep our borders secure, rear your son. I was the one who had to steal my mother-in-law's jewels to buy food to feed those pig suitors, with only old men and scrappy boys to defend us should they turn on me. King of Ithaca? I was King of Ithaca. I saw its true treasures and I fought for them after you left to pursue foreign riches because of that ugly trait you would never admit. Ambition. I could have forgiven you for having to do your duty had you not come back and destroyed the Ithaca I nurtured, plundered it the way those other idiot kings plundered Troy, plundered its safety, its comfort, its womb. I expected better from you. You knew better once. Or did I hardly know you after all? It's hard to tell. When you told me stories, I was gullible, indulgent, just as a new young wife should be. I knew you must be exaggerating, but I never thought you ever lied. After you left, when I started to hear tales about you, the peril, the monsters, the goddesses, I realised the stories you told me were to keep me hanging on your voice, your mystique your reputation that you love so much and at the same time hold me at arm's length so I never got near you, your devious mind. You like to hear me talk, to explore my hidden depths but I've survived this long because I'm a good listener. A good listener can get away with many things. I still don't know why you chose me. Three princesses of Greece, Helen the whore, Clytemnestra the husband killer. I had to be the good one to survive. My virtue and piety were my tools and I quietly thrived in a way that neither of them could. Helen only wanted to be desired. Clytemnestra felt entitled to revenge, power. I just wanted to be seen and to be left alone. And I was lucky, really. You delivered on both counts. There has always been three Penelopes. The me that I was, that you never really saw for all your careful weighing up. There was the me I had to become. The one I like best. The one who owes you no credit. Then there's the me you conjured up to miss, to pine for to hook your stories on so that your treacheries were noble. For the longest time, I fooled myself that all I wanted was for you to come home. I forget at what point I started to wish you dead, so I could have some finality, some new purpose. Penelope, the ever-faithful, loyal wife. If only you knew how my blood boiled when I saw through your ridiculous disguise when you returned. Now, I thought, now you have the nerve to come back when my youth is spent and my love turned bitter and my patience with any man worn as thin as the skin on my hands from weaving that damn shroud. I can forgive you all of it, except the maids. You never once acknowledged the blood of my maids, my girls. You never asked for our side of the story, what we had to endure in your absence. You always had another tale of daring do to fill the heavy silence. 
Well, now we are both on the other side of life with nothing but eternity to occupy us. Now you'll have my story. Our story. And don't worry, there will be heroic acts and thrills and chills. There will be blood and anguish. And above all, at the centre of it, like any good story involving you, there will be monsters. Thanks so much for listening. Before I wrap up, I'd like to recommend a fantastic podcast called Alternative Stories and Fake Realities, who've got some great audio dramas based on Greek myth, folklore, and lots more. And we've got some exciting collaborations in the pipeline coming up. So watch this space. Feel free to like and subscribe on my YouTube channel. You can find me under Lorna Meehan or Rebel Heroines Podcast. I'm also on Twitter now as Rebel underscore Heroines. If you'd like to get in touch, send me any pre-recorded drama or poetry on theme, please email me at lornaemehan at gmail.com. Please share with anyone who might be interested. Next month, I'm talking about a group of lesser known rebel heroines who were there from the very beginning. The Titanesses. Ooh, they had some clout. And we will also be having our first guest. I know, exciting. Talking about her debut on theme novel. Oof. So you don't want to miss that. Come join us next month.